Okay, we'd like to welcome you to our weekly Bible and current event study for 10-21-07, October 21st, 07. And today we're going to be doing a teaching. I don't know if this is going to encompass the whole teaching, if this is going to go into a part one or a part two, but we're going to be talking extensively about Halloween and uh, its origin, its history, what's evolved into today, which is pretty obvious. But the Bible says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And we're going to look at what the foundation of Halloween is. And if you have a plant that's been corrupted, if the foundations have been destroyed, if you have something that's been totally leavened, then you need to get it out of your life. And we'll see with Halloween, from its very, very inception, that's all that it ever was, was purely from Satan and purely leavened. Now, Halloween as we know it, originated in Europe on the eve of All Saints Day. It was brought over, but it was brought over from the Satanic Druid culture of the Celts, originally. Now, what the, the Druids were the high priests over a race of people called the Celts. You've heard of Celtic stuff? And they were like the high priest, more so witches, that ruled over this race of people. Uh, particularly like in Ireland and these types of places, um, Scotland and those types of places. Now, Halloween itself is often confused with All Saints Day, which was originally in May. And with the influence of the Roman Catholic Church, it was moved to actually November 1st. Now remember, the Roman Catholic Church was instrumental in paganizing a lot of different um, holidays and amalgamating them into... Well, actually, a lot of times these, these, these holidays were already paganized, but they brought them into the Catholic Church to try to give them some type of Christian veneer. Okay? So this is why this was done. Halloween, Halloween the actual word, actually means the eve before a holy day. Okay? So they're saying Halloween, the eve before all, the eve before all saints day, is, is why they're calling it Halloween, because that actual word means the eve before a holy day. Uh, now... This is another little take on this. I'm going to read this. This is from um, Jesus is Savior. Now, when you go to this website, Jesus is Savior, it's Jesus-is-Savior.com. Okay, because I guess I've had some people tell me that they go to Jesus is Savior and it's a Catholic site, which is, you know, definitely not my goal to send you to a Catholic site. So, um, during the Middle Ages, around uh, 600 years ago, the Roman Catholic Church at that time decided to make the changeover from pagan religion to Christianity a bit easier, and therefore allow the new converts to maintain some of their pagan feasts. See, this, this religion was actively seeking to placate pagans so that they would feel more comfortable, which is really what the modern day church is doing today. It's no different. I mean, you go to Smiley Joe Olston, he was just on TV the other night, and they were interviewing him. They're calling him now the most influential Christian in America. And, you know, he's all, boy, he's just ear to ear smile. I mean, this guy is happy-go-lucky, you know, bluebird on his shoulder, couldn't get the guy down if he tried, you know, I mean, just unbelievable, zippy dee doo doc kind of guy, and he, uh, yeah, he was on there, and, and uh, you know, he's, he's pretty hardcore, but they were showing pictures of his stadium church and his big globe twirling behind him and, and things of this nature, and I guarantee you, old Smiley Joe, he's not preaching on Halloween today, most likely. They're probably selling pumpkins out in the parking lot, like so many of these other churches that I drive by, and it makes me want to basically get sick. They're actually profiting off the devil's holiday, which is pretty much the ultimate hypocrisy if you think about it for a church. Okay, so, um, but the the Catholic Church, what they did is they incorporated this uh, Halloween as the Eve of All Saints Day back in the Middle Ages, to make it easier for their pagan converts. It wouldn't offend them as much. And, and again, like I said, that's exactly what they're doing in today's church today. In today's seeker-friendly churches, where you've got your rock bands and every kind of secular program, and, and, and no, no uh, really no dress code, whatever you want to do, you know. It's really no different. They just kind of got to jump on everybody, I'd say. So it was agreed, however, that from... Now on, they would uh, these pagan feasts would be celebrated as Christian feasts. Now, this is true for all of these things like Christmas, which should be called just Xmas, Easter, which should be really called Ishtar, uh, Saint Valentine's Day. There is a pagan 
connection between virtually every holiday that we have other than that I know of Thanksgiving. That's about the only one that's actually good. Okay. Uh, if you want to know more about this, Cutting Edge has a video from a guy named Doc Marquise. He's the guy that came out of generational Luciferianism. The guy was like a blue-blood aristocrat. And he came out of this, and now he's actually done. He's got a six-part teaching on um, the arrival of the Antichrist. Uh, he's also got another one on uh, America's... I, for, I forget what it's called. Uh, America's satanic holidays or whatever. And he goes through all these, these holidays. And in the occult calendar, he will show you you know, how they're all, there's all this numerology associated with them. Um, things like May Day, which is May 1st, which is also called Beltane, which is a very, very high satanic holiday. Halloween is just one more pagan holiday. But it just happens to be the highest pagan holiday of the whole year. For, let's say, a somebody that's a witch or, or into witchcraft. This is their highest holy holiday. Now, the Bible says in Daniel that when the Antichrist arises, he is going to cause craft to prosper. Witchcraft, in its pure essence, is going to end up becoming the one world religion. We know that because the Bible predicts it so. And if you think about it, if the Antichrist is going to have seven years, do you think he's going to promote good, hard, hardcore Christianity? He's going to really promote witchcraft at its roots. Knowing all of this, and knowing how satanic Halloween is, knowing it, that it's the highest satanic holiday of the whole year. Maybe we want to pay a little bit of attention to this, particularly thinking about the times that we're moving into right now. So going back to this description, it was agreed, however, that from now on they would be celebrated as Christian feasts. Now, this is what the, the Catholic, uh, Catholic Church did. They, they amalgamated these, these pagan uh, holidays and they put a Christian veneer on them. Okay? So instead of praying to their heathen gods, they would now pray and remember the death of the saints. For this reason, the Catholic Church decided to move All Saints Day to November 1st, because it was actually on May, in, I think May 1st, before this. Or it was, it was originally in May. Okay. So they decided to move All Saints Day to November 1st, and the Mass, the Catholic Mass, was to be celebrated... On that day is All Hollow Mass. That's a quote. And it's one word. A-L Hollow Mass. One word. So that was the particular Catholic Mass that was be, to be celebrated basically on Halloween. In consequence of this, the evening prior... Or actually, I'm sorry, that was the, the, um, the Mass that was to be celebrated on the, the uh, Saints Day. In consequence of this, the evening prior to this day was named All Hallowed Eve which subsequently was abbreviated to Halloween. This is how we get the words. This is how they evolved into what they evolved into. Okay? So let me read that last sentence again so you understand it. In consequence of this, the evening prior to this day, this day being All Saints Day, was named All Hallowed Eve, evening, which was sub subsequently abbreviated to Halloween. In spite of this effort to make October 31st a holy evening, all the old customs continued to be practiced, and this made this evening anything but holy. So now, let's just look a little bit further. Now, what churches will do now, too, is they'll sell, they'll, they, they have their harvest festivals. Okay, and we're going to... There's no way that, that you can put a Christian veneer on this in any kind of good conscience. There's just no way that, that uh, you can... These 501c3... Ch church corporate whores can go around and try to justify everything that they do. They could sell their pumpkins, they can do whatever they want to do. And we're going to look at what the meaning of the pumpkins, um, these jack o -lanterns. we're going to look at that in depth, what that actually means. We're going to look, I mean, the, the, the fact that these Christian, they call themselves Christian churches, are actually promoting and making merchandise off the most wicked night of the year is incomprehensible. I can't... Uh, I, I, I really wouldn't want to be in their shoes. I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I really wouldn't want to be in their shoes. The word mass... Now, this is from a, a dictionary I found online. is a public celebration of the Eucharist in the Roman Catholic Church and some Protestant churches. Okay? 
It's the sacrament of the Eucharist. Now remember, we just talked about that what the Catholic Church did is they moved All Saints Day to November 1st, and the Mass was to be celebrated on that day as All Hallow Mass. Okay? So this was a, for the Catholic Church, this was a very uh, high thing that they were doing. This is one of their main things they were celebrating. Okay? They celebrated a particular Mass. The Mass, the word Mass actually means a public celebration of the Eucharist in the Roman Catholic Church. So let's just look, we're just going to do a little rabbit trail off on this, because I think it's, it's important to note this. In the Roman Catechism, which is basically the Roman Catholic's way of teaching you about Catholic Church, this is a quote from their Roman Catechism, um, number 1367, page, or, or page 381. The sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one single, single sacrifice. The victim is one and the same. Only the manner of offering is different. In the divine sacrifice which is celebrated in the Mass, the same Christ who offered himself once in a bloody manner on the altar of the cross is contained and offered in an unbloody manner. End of quote. <laughs> Do you believe this? So, they even say it. The, the same Christ was offered once in a bloody manner. Now, now we've got a way of containing him. The Catholic Church figured out a way to... Package up Jesus Christ, contain him, and then offer him in an unbloody way. So it's more palatable that way. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says, if it's, a sac if it's the sacrifice of Jesus, it cannot be done in an unbloody manner, according to the Bible. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Jesus Christ shed his blood to pay our sin debt. Okay, That was Hebrews um, 9.22. The victim... Always Jesus Christ, by the way, is the host. And is another name for the Eucharist. Okay, so, remember, I said that this is from the Roman Catechism. The sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one single sacrifice. The victim, one and the same. So the victim, which is always Jesus Christ in the Catholic Church, by the way, is the host. Or is another name for the Eucharist, which is the little, you know, communion wafer. Okay? Now, they actually have... Um, a special one in what they call a monstrous, which the priest will hold up, and you know, there's an actual communion host in that. And there's sunburst off the side. It's, it's basically repackaged sun worship. They're worshiping the way for God. Okay? And the Latin word for host literally means victim. Okay? That's called hostia, which actually means victim in Latin. So the victim is not one and the same, and never will be, no matter who offers it. What happened at Calvary is a one-time historical event accomplished for this purpose. Hebrews 10.14 says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Okay, so it's one offering, not multiple offerings. They, they continually believe that they have to re-crucify the Son of God through this Eucharist ceremony in order to atone continually for their sins. Even though Jesus Christ paid the sin debt once and for all, they believe it has to be done over and over and over. It makes them feel more holy. They feel like, oh wow, look at us, we're doing this. You know, we're actually, the priest can actually, um, through, through the doctrine of transubstantiation, they believe that they can actually transform the literal body and blood of Jesus Christ into the Catholic wine and into the Catholic communion host. They really believe it. And I mean the literal body, I don't mean the figurative. I mean the literal. They believe that. That's the doctrine of transubstantiation. Look it up if you don't believe me. They believe that their black-robed devil pedophile priests, now I'm not saying they're all pedophiles, but many of them are, Okay, they believe that these black-robed devils can do something that no one on the planet could ever do and no one on the planet ever will be able to do. It's an abomination from the pit of hell. Also quoting from the Roman Catechism, um, this is page 380, um, number 1364. When the church celebrates the Eucharist, she commemorates Christ's Passover. As often as the sacrifice of the cross, which Christ, our Pasach, has been sacrificed, is celebrated on the altar, the word of our redemption is carried out. So see, they have to continually do this in order to get redeemed. See, everything about the Catholic Church, and, and 
virtually every other false religion that's based in works is all about works. But the Bible says, for, your say, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And see, a Catholic can go and say, well, I'm a good Catholic, I'm going to boast of this. I, got, I earned my way into heaven by keeping the seven sacraments, and doing this and doing that. And it's all, it's all an abomination in the, in the sight of God. Not by works of righteousness are, are we saved, but according to His mercy He saved us. That's what the Bible says. For we are all together as an unclean thing, and all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. Isaiah 64, 6. So, you can't earn your way into heaven. It just doesn't happen that way. It's a free gift. You either freely receive or you freely reject. Another thing from the Roman Catechism, every time this mystery is celebrated, the work of our redemption is carried on. <laughs> what a lie from the pit of hell. Now, what does the Bible say? According to the Bible, our redemption, to put away sin, was, at one, was a one-time act. One time. Which was completed on the cross, and it is said to be finished. Hebrews 9.26 And now, or by now, once in the end of the world, hath he, Jesus, appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hebrews, and then continuing, um, By the which we are all sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. John 9, 19.30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And it's finished. It's finished. You can't take to, you can't add to or take away from the, the redemptive, the redemption that Jesus Christ supplied for us through his death, burial, and resurrection. So anyway, I know that was a little rabbit trail there, but I just wanted to touch on that because a lot of this hinges on the mass. Okay, originally this had a lot to do with why Halloween uh, why All Saints Day was actually moved, and how it got amalgamated in with Halloween, and how things got their names. So, I just wanted to try to kind of establish a, uh, a good foundation to build upon. Now, Halloween itself celebrates their god called Lord Samhain. Okay? Now, Samhain is actually spelled S-A-M-H-A-I-N. Sounds like Samhain. But Samhain is actually the cultic way that you pronounce it. Who is this Lord Samhain? Well, he's considered the Lord of the Dead, the Horn God, the Stag God, basically Satan. Okay? Halloween is actually celebrated by pagans as Satan's birthday. And I mean that literally. They actually celebrate it as that as well. Originally it was celebrated on October 29th through October 31st. It was called the, the, Celt, the Celtic New Year. Okay? This was actually, for the Celts, their New Year. Not only was it the most highest, most wicked night of, 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 um, of paganism that there was, but it was celebrated as their New Year. It was how they divided their pagan calendar, essentially. It was a three-day fire festival. Okay, we're going to understand, we're going to look at what they were burning. Okay? It was also considered the highest, holiest night of human sacrifice. The preferred sacrifice for a Satanist is always an infant. Okay, I'm not saying that was always the case with Halloween. But we're going to look at this in depth. One of the places that this originally originated in the Celtic religion was in Stonehenge. Okay, we see these big pictures of Stonehenge. Okay, we wonder, oh, I wonder how the rocks got there. What did they do here, and why is it here? Well, it's been proven. It's it's like an astronom. They they you can use it to do a lot of what they call stargazing and and uh, astrology, these types of things, which is forbidden by the Bible. Stonehenge is located in the Salisbury Plains of England, and it's considered what they call a megalithic circle. But actually, what it was is a druid temple of human sacrifice. Archaeologists have unearthed over 4,000 human skeletal remains underneath Stonehenge. 4,000! That's a lot of people to kill. Now, these megalithic circles are all over the countryside there. They're not just in Stonehenge. Stonehenge happens to be the biggest, most well-known. Actually, I don't even think it's the biggest. I think there's some that are actually bigger in, as far as girth. But it's the one that gets all the press and all the attention. I mean, if you go there, if... if I've seen I've seen many news accounts even recently where they're you know they have their uh, 
uh, all kind of pagan festivals at Stonehenge. Still, to this day, I mean, they, they do the whole witchcraft ritual the whole nine yards. I'm not saying they're, they're, they're killing people there, I mean, unless they're really being covert. But um, they still do the same stuff. So this is, this is kind of, this ties into uh, in Halloween and a lot of its history, okay? So they were, they were sacrificing human beings. Now we're going to look at this further, so kind of bear with me here. The tradition of trick-or-treat. Okay, where did this actually originally come from? Well, in its purest form, if we look at the Druids, which were the high priests over the Celts, what would happen is, is prior to Halloween, okay, they would have to somehow appropriate these human sacrifices. Okay, now I'm going to go into the reasons for all of this in a second, so again, bear with me. But they would actually visit castles, mansions, the countryside, in search of human sacrifices, human offerings, okay? When we talk about trick or treat, the treat is if a human offering was actually given, okay? If you actually were in a house and you had these druid high priests which ruled over, over the Celtic people, the, the, the Celts were terrified of the druids, okay? Because they were dealing in very, very high level witchcraft. If you have a witch, somebody involved in the occult, that's actually using human sacrifice in there you're talking now you're dealing with the highest level and echelon of witchcraft so you're dealing with the most, most powerful form of witchcraft when you're dealing with human sacrifice which is the largest abomination to god okay but you're also dealing with very 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 powerful magic now think about it these were these people didn't have the gospel they didn't know about jesus christ they didn't they didn't have this uh, advantage therefore they really didn't have a whole lot of protection I would not be intimidated by this as a Christian. Okay, because if you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit living inside you. You can quote the Bible. There, there is great power in the weapons of our warfare, because the Bible talks about the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but the mighty through the pulling down of strongholds. But a Celtic person living under the Druid uh, high priesthood did not have that same... He didn't have that same advantage. So they were very, very, uh, very superstitious and very, very scared of what might happen to them. So if they came to your house and you actually gave them someone from your household, okay, to sacrifice, the treat, that would be the treat, okay? If you did that, what, the, what these Druid high priests would do is leave a jack-o'-lantern. Okay, now this is where all of these traditions ultimately originated from, okay? They didn't just come out of nowhere, okay? If we want to go back to the purest, most satanic form of this stuff, this is what we're looking at here. So what is a jack-o'-lantern, okay? A jack-o'-lantern is an ancient symbol of a damned soul. That's what it was actually is. Where today, you know, basically a pumpkin with a face carved in it. In this case, though, the jack-o'-lantern would be left and would, would be like a hollowed-out pumpkin, grotesquely carved, previously filled with human fat, or tallow, which was then lit. Okay? I'm not making this up. I'm telling you, this is how they did things back then. And I guarantee you, this is how things are going to go back to. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to confirm that. The treat would, would actually end up being that everyone inside would be protected from the demonic forces summoned that night. Now, what do, you, what do you mean by that, the demonic forces summoned? Well, in these places like Stonehenge, in these places, and we're going to talk about exactly what they did in a second, they would have big um, rituals, demonic entities would be summoned. They believed that this time of the year, this time of the Celtic New Year, particularly Halloween, the veil between the spirit world was at its thinnest. And these evil, malevolent spirits could pass freely packs back and forth very, very easily. Okay? And that's why they did what they did. Okay? But this jack-o'-lantern would supposedly protect them from the demonic entities that were going to be leashed that night because the veil between the spirit world, they believe, was its thinnest. Now, I'm sure there's some validity to that. Okay? From an occultic standpoint, I guarantee you there's validity that the veil between the spirit world, I mean, why is it the most wicked night of the year? Why is it that more, more bad stuff ends up happening around that time of year? Because most likely, because they're absolutely right about that. So the trick now, 
trick or treat, the trick would be if a human offering was not given. So let's say they came to your door, the Druid priest came on your door, and they were out, okay, we want a human out. You didn't say anything, or you said, no, go away. Okay, now here's the trick. If you did that, guess what they drew on your door? A hexagram. The most wicked symbol in all of witchcraft. The hexagram. Oh, but it's... we. I got accused the other day of being anti-Semitic. Yeah, because I, 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 I guess I, I don't like the uh, hexagram. How dare I? How dare I not like something satanic? I guess I just have to take whatever... The Jews, Jewish people do hook, line, and sinker and just love and embrace it all, even though if, even if it's straight from the pit of hell. I want all the Jews to be saved. The Bible says it's his will that not one would perish, but that all would come to repentance. Okay? But the hexagram's evil. Okay? I don't care who's using it. It's evil. doesn't matter. If, if, if I was using it, it would still be evil. So I'm not holding them to a higher accountability than I would hold myself. Okay? I'm just saying that that symbol has nothing to do with really has nothing to do with the Jewish race at all. Nothing. I have a whole teaching I've done on the hexagram that you can go and listen to. It's part of my sermons. Uh, you can go up to uh, my website and you can listen to those. I think it's a two-part teaching. So I don't want to go down that rabbit trail anymore. But the hexagram was actually drawn on their door with human blood. Okay? That would be left on their front door. Now, if you want to know more about also the six-pointed star, there's a great book by O.J. Graham called the six-pointed star. That's what the name of it, the six-pointed star. It's a, very, it's a little, almost like a booklet. It's a book, but it's a, almost more like a booklet. And you can read it probably in one sitting, and it'll give you a thorough education on this. Or you can listen to my, my teachings on uh, Sermons Audio. Remember, a hexagram, if you think about the word hex, to hex someone is to curse them. Wouldn't it make sense them putting a hexagram on your door if they were trying to curse you? Because that's what they were doing, right? Hex. It's a six-pointed star. Hmm. You could actually get 666 out of the six-pointed star. There's like, I don't know, there, there's six, six triangles, six. There, there, there's a lot of sixes associated with the hexagram. Not only that it's a six-pointed star. It's actually a symbol for really 666. And there's a lot of conjecture saying that the hexagram will actually be part of the mark of the beast in some way, shape, or form, probably in some type of tattoo um, version. And I've done a teaching on that as well that you can go listen to. But hexagram would be planted on the front door. The blood that was used to paint the front door, the, the hexagram on the front door, was taken from a dead body that was being dragged around by a cable tow. Now, this sounds crazy. But I'm telling you, this is the way they practice their religion. And it's going to get, we're going back to this. Unfortunately, I mean, I'm not saying born-again Christians are. But because you don't end up ultimately going back to this, you may have to pay with this for, you may have to pay for not celebrating things with your life. I don't know. I hope not. But I know there's going to come a time when it's going to get real, real nasty. And... The Bible says that the Antichrist will cause craft to prosper, witchcraft. And that is the one world, the essence of the one world religion. It's going to be amalgamation of all religions, but the essence is going to be witchcraft. So this blood, which was taken from a dead body, being dragged around by a cable tow. Now, what would happen then is someone would be driven insane or die from fear that night because of the demonic forces unleashed upon them that night. Because, see, they, don't, they didn't have any demonic protection at that point. They, all they had is curses from the Druid High Priest. They had a hexagram on their front door. And that was basically like their open game for the devils. So, then, let's say now they've got all their, their human sacrifices rounded up. Okay, Let's bring them back to Stonehenge or whatever megalithic circle they're at or wherever they're at. Let's bring them back. And now we're going to have our games. We're going to have some fun games. First game is bobbin for apples. You see where we get this, this tradition from. Okay? Several human offerings would be brought before a huge cauldron. The cauldron was filled with a cider-like liquid that had been boiling away for anywhere from four to six hours. Now remember, this is, a, this is something they did pretty much every year. They had it down. They had things, you know, they had their system down here on, on how they, they did this. A victim would be selected and an apple would be thrown into the cauldron. If the victim could grab the apple between his teeth in one try, he would be set free. 
If the victim did not, he would be beheaded immediately. Okay, now that would actually, to be quite honest with you, compared to what the other thing, although that sounds pretty horrific, being beheaded would be the most merciful way to go compared to what we're going to be looking at. Because of the boiling liquid at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, if the victim grabbed the apple within his teeth, some or all of the following medical conditions could or would happen. Face and the neck would be partially or permanently scarred. Partial or complete blindness would happen. Partial or complete loss of hearing would happen. Partial or complete loss of the sinus canals would happen. Speech impediments, respiratory damage. Partial or total loss of eyebrows and cranial hair. Now this was the idea of the druids the, the idea of a druid's fun, you know, fun game to have. So this is where we get the tradition of bobbing for apples. Now, if you did get the apple, they would let you go. They would, they actually would be true to the word, they would let you go. But you'd be disfigured the rest of your life. So, moving right along, then, what we have next to look at is this thing called the wicker man. I'm going to key on this a little bit. I think this is pretty noteworthy. They would actually erect, the druids, prior to this, a anywhere from 20 to 30 foot tall, what they call wicker man. Okay, That would have different compartments or cages inside it. Wicker, as you know, is a very, very durable material, okay, and that it, that it can actually be burned. This wicker man was actually written by Julius Caesar. He actually confirmed this in Julius Caesar's writings in his commentaries on the Gaelic War. He actually talked about this, that this is the way that they did things, okay. Um, and we're going we're gonna to reference that a little bit more in a second. What would happen then is they would actually bring the human sacrifices and they would put them into the wicker man in these particular uh, uh, cages that they had set up in the wicker man. There's no way you could get out of these cages. What would then happen is that Kurnos, the demon or fallen angel of fire, would then be summoned. See, there's different fallen angels, there's different demons that do different things. They have different specialties. Kurnos happened to be supposedly the god of fire. Victims would then be consumed in the fire as an offering to Lord Samhain. And this would typically be done at midnight. Okay, so now on Halloween midnight, just understand that I'm not saying everybody, all witches are erecting wicker mans. I'm not saying all witches are, 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 are offering human sacrifices. A lot of them are probably offering maybe animal sacrifice. They're going to do what they can get away with. Okay, And it depends on the level of witchcraft they're at. If you're in white witchcraft, they may not do anything. They may not... Uh, they may not offer any kind of uh, human sacrifice or, or even an animal, but those that are into the black arts, preferably this is the way they would celebrate Halloween. Okay? These human offerings were done to appease their gods. They believed that this had to be done in order to appease their gods. This is where we also get the tradition of, you ever heard bonfires? Well, those were actually, they were also called more fires, but bonfires is basically a shortened version of bone fires, where you're burning people alive. That's where we get the tradition of bonfires. They believed that the veil separating the physical world from the spiritual world were at their thinnest, and that these spirits could cross over on that night into our physical world the most, the, the easiest. These bone fires, or bonfires, or now this wicker man burning, were lit to guide the spirits to the physical world, as though they needed help. And then what happened then, is that the costumes that, that uh, this is where we get the tradition of costumes, okay? Costumes were worn by the pagans in order to supposedly keep certain evil spirits in line. Okay, they were grotesque, horrible monster outfits worn to frighten evil spirits. That's essentially what they believed. That they had to wear these costumes. This is where we get all the traditions for Halloween. I think we just about covered just about everything with the traditions. The Druids believed that on the night before um, November 1st, October 31st, Samhain, 
call together the wicked souls of the spirits which had been condemned to live in the bodies of animals during the year which had just transpired. Since they were afraid of these spirits, they chose October 31st as a day to sacrifice to their gods, hoping that they would protect them. So see, this, this, these sacrifices, these human sacrifices in particular, or whatever sacrifices they were making, were done for protection for themselves. They were also done many times to ensure a, um, a good harvest. Remember, it's the harvest festival that you know, Christians tried to evolve from this. Uh, blessings in regard to that. Since they were afraid of these spirits, they chose October 31st as the day to sacrifice their gods, hoping they would receive protection. They really believed that on this day they were surrounded by strange spirits, ghosts, witches, fairies, and elves, who came out to hurt them. In addition to this, they also believed that cats were holy animals, and they considered them to represent people who lived formerly, which is a life in the pit of hell, because that's reincarnation. And as punishment for the evil deeds, were reincarnated as a cat. All this explains why witches, ghosts, and cats are part of the Halloween thing today. So what I'm trying to do is tie it all into today. Where did we get all these traditions from? Remember, the Bible says, through the traditions of men, you've made the word of God of none effect. Now, I'm going to veer off here a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit more about this wicker man. Now, I got this off Wikipedia on the wicker man. And they even got a little picture from a 1973 British film called The Wicker Man. And there was also a film this year made, or in 2006, called The Wicker Man. I saw excerpts of that one. Today, a wicker man is burned as part of neo-pagan festivals, festivities, especially Beltane, a rite of spring. Um, Beltane is May 1st. It's probably the second highest satanic holiday that there is. And every single high satanic holiday... Okay, including Yule and Christmas, including Valentine's Day, including Ishtar, Easter, believe it or not, Groundhog's Day is one of them, um, including Halloween, in their purest form, every single one of these holidays, if you're at the highest levels, require human sacrifice in order to practice the religion in the proper, Satanism in the proper way. Why should this surprise anybody? Doesn't Satan come to, you know, kill and destroy and steal? I mean, isn't that what he's all about? Why would this be a big surprise that Satanism, at its highest levels, would practice human sacrifice? Knowing we can look back in the Bible, and it's all through the Bible, offering your children, passing, letting your children pass through the fire to, to appease gods, in order to gain some type of financial or prosper, prosperous blessing. It's all throughout the Bible. And you're telling me that we're living in a day and time that's just as wicked as them. If it, I'm sure it's more wicked in a lot of ways. And you're telling me that this doesn't go on ever? And we're more wicked than they? I don't think so. Just a little more hidden. Just like abortion, you know, is basically human sacrifice or child sacrifice. It's just done in the womb. In darkness. So that gives it, it makes it more palatable because you, you don't actually see, you know, the baby being mutilated. Now, in the near future, we're going to be doing a whole teaching. I know I touched on this before with the abortion. But we're going to be doing a whole teaching on um, the sacrament of the abortion. That the witches believe, there's many witches that have written about abortion as a sacrament. Something that they do as part of their religion. Well, this is no different what we're talking about today with Halloween. This is something that's part of their religion that they do. Okay? So, it's, it's just... Um, interesting thing. We're also, next week, we're going to be doing a whole teaching on this blasphemous first 37 minutes of, it's called the Zeitgeist movie. I've been getting a ton of emails about it. People are watching this thing and falling away, just like the Bible predicted in 2 Thessalonians 2. And people are watching this movie and the ones that were saying that, well, I'm, I was a Christian, I'm not a Christian anymore after watching the first 37 minutes of this movie. It's having this big of an impact on people. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says anything that can be shaken will be shaken. God's going to separate the wheat from the tares. He's going to separate us. And it's really no surprise that this is happening. But I'm going to try to do a full rebuttal on the first 37 minutes because it is one of the most, the worst heresies I've ever seen in my life. It's all based on lies, too. At least the first 37 minutes. There's a lot of other truth after that. That's the problem. But anyway, um, so the wicker man, 
this is from Wikipedia, is, is, is burned as part of neo-pagan festivals, especially Beltane, a rite of spring. Wicker men are tall, humanoid, wood structures, woven with flexible sticks, such as the willow used in wicker furniture and fencing. The Wicker Man Festival is an annual rock and dance music event that takes place in Kirkcudbrightshire, Scotland. Now, remember, what I just talked about was from the Druids in the Middle Ages. Now let's flash forward it today. Is there anything to be done with this Wicker Man today? Well, what did we just read here? It's, an, it's the Wicker Man Festival. It's an annual rock and dance music. I mean, that's appropriate. It's a rock concert, dance thing. In Scotland, its main feature is the burning of a large wooden effigy on the last night. Similarly, a Wicker Man is burned each year... <laughs> at the Buster Ancient Farm in Hampshire, England. And the American Burning Man Festival features a large burnable man as well. The Burning Man, they, they hold that, they just had that out in Arizona. These, I don't know how many people they had this year. It was like 50,000 people or 100,000 or something out in the desert in Arizona. You heard of this? It's called the Burning Man. They, yeah, man, we're getting the band back together. Let's go out to the desert and be, act like pagans. They, and I'm serious, this is what they do. They go out there and they Absolutely, it's it's like, I don't know, a week or two of total debauchery. And the height of it, they burn this man, an effigy, this big... So see, this Wicker Man thing is, a, is, is very appropriate for today. And it's going to become more and more appropriate as the world gets more wicked. Perhaps the use of this effigy that is most prominent in the modern culture of subconscious, is the 1973 British horror film, The Wicker Man, directed by Robin Hardy. The film tells the story of a devout Christian policeman, played by Edward Woodward, who uncovers a malevolent secret of, pagan, of this pagan cult in a remote Scottish island. Oh, imagine that. Isn't that kind of just what I talked about? But he's a devout Christian. He discovers this pagan cult in this remote Scottish island. Hmm. An ancient remake of the film produced by Boaz Davidson and starring Nicolas Cage is released in 2006. Did you know they released a show in that last year called The Wicker Man, which was a remake of this 1973 show? With Nicolas Cage, one of the main actors in Hollywood. Hmm. We're going to talk about this a little bit more. The story being set on a private island in the Puget Sound of Washington. The set for Iron Maiden. Now, Iron Maiden is one of the worst uh, hardcore satanic rock groups that there is. They sing a song called 666, The Number of the Beast. All these songs, okay? Um, the set for Iron Maiden's Brave New World Tour featured a large mechanical wicker man as part of the special effects as a reference to their song, The Wicker Man. And I'm telling you, Iron Maiden's one of the worst groups. I've seen them in concert. I hate to say it, but I have. That was one of my favorite groups when I was, like, unsaved in high school, okay? I was into that. Unfortunately, but praise the Lord... I do remember the pit from whence God dug me. And uh, I praise the Lord Jesus Christ that he brought me out of all that. But anyway, um, so this is a little primer here on the Wicker Man. Now, the 1973 film version of the, of the Wicker Man, this man, this, this, um, in the, in the uh, movie he's portrayed as a devout Christian, is seized by islanders. This guy that is the ruler of the island, Lord Summer, or Lord Summer's Isle, um, drolly notes that the sacrifice will be especially significant because this man who's this born-again Christian is a virgin. Now that's also another thing they highly prize. They prize, they prize innocence. When they have a human sacrifice, the more innocent, the better. A virgin is, is a better a, The best sacrifice, from what I've been told, is an infant boy. Okay, that's the highest human sacrifice that you can offer. Um, this Christian admonishes Lord Summer's Isle that if his sacrifice does not work, the next year the islanders will have no choice but to sacrifice Lord Summer Isle, because he was their king. Summer Isle appears certain that the sacrifice of how he will work. Now, the reason they're sacrificing this man in this show is because their crops are failing, and they believe that by sacrificing this man, they'll, they'll have a good harvest the next... This is why they do these things, okay? It hasn't changed, okay? It's just they have different reasons for their sacrifices. Um, this Christian is forced into the belly of a large hollow wicker man statue, which is set on fire. Isn't that what we just talked about? Huh. 
all the pagan Jews. Oh, I wonder what Hollywood's trying to convey to us here. In the final shot of the film, the islanders surround the Bernie Wicker Man and sing the Middle English folk song, Summer is Ikernan in, whatever that means, while the terrified Christian shouts out Psalm 23 and implores divine vengeance on the island and its inhabitants. That's how the movie ends. That was the 1973 remake, or, or make of The Wicker Man. Well, what about the 2006 version with Nicolas Cage? Well, I've actually seen excerpts from this show. Okay? I went up on the internet and did a little research on the show. And people, this one lady wrote this review about this show and said, Oh, it was the most asinine, stupid, dumb show I've ever seen in my life. The problem is, is these people writing these reviews know nothing about witchcraft, and they know nothing about paganism. So it looks stupid to them. Okay? But it's not stupid. In this particular show, Nicolas Cage travels to a private island, Summer Isle, which is on Puget Sound, Washington, where um, there's an old, an odd community that plant fruits. Uh, they, 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 have this, they have all these beehives there and stuff that they tend to. Um, it's an island totally ruled by witches. Okay? That's the set scene in the set of this whole island. And they have men there that are totally subservient to them. And these men are like little worms. They don't talk back. They don't, they don't even talk. They're like vegetable mutes almost. And the women totally rule the whole hierarchy of the island. They're all witches, every single one of them. Okay? And their lives totally, totally revolve around paganism. So as he's... Um, it's, it's the same theme as the first show. The local pagans practicing old rituals to improve their harvest. And um, what's happened is they've lured this guy, he's a, a Nicholas Cage is like this cop, they've lured him onto this island because they're going to use him as a human sacrifice. Okay, And by the time he finally finds all this out, it's too late. Okay, And again, you have to ask yourself, why... You know, why would Hollywood be wanting to, to uh, make this so abundantly clear to us about this? Here's an actual uh, scene from the show, and it shows uh, a whole bunch of witches, and the head witch is at the end here. And then it shows, I believe, I believe these are men in the background, and they've got all these grotesque masks on. Well, what did we say that they just did? when they actually did the true uh, Wicker Man burning at, at like Stonehenge and these types of places. They dressed up in costumes. Why was that? To make sure that they keep supposedly these evil spirits in line. Okay? And so there's a lot of parallels here with this show and, you know, what really goes on in these types of ceremonies. Well, uh, Doug just touched on a good point here um, in regard to... People would say, the objection you're going to hear about law this is that, oh, well, if they were really doing all these human sacrifices, you know, it would be, it would be all over the news, and, and uh, they would be, well, number one, the people that are involved in this type of stuff are the highest level people in our government and in the media, okay, which is controlled and owned through these wicked people, okay. There is a massive cover-up of this going on. I was watching a documentary the other day, I, or not the other day, but a, a ways back, on uh, something about New York City. And when they said the number of people that went missing in New York City alone, I was absolutely astounded. I was like, I mean, like, like per year. It was way into the thousands. And these are not people that they're putting on the front of the newspaper, putting on milk cartons. Okay, these are people that go missing and nobody cares about a lot of times. Maybe they're prostitutes or whatever. And, and they're not talking. Now, these are perfect candidates for human sacrifice. They go missing, they don't turn up, and the media doesn't say a thing about it. So understand, thousands and thousands and thousands of people turn up missing every single year in America. Okay? And a lot of them turn up missing to this very thing that we're talking about today here. So, the next picture that I looked at here was an actually, this is from the 2006 Wicker Man movie. And this is the best picture I've seen of what a true Wicker Man actually looks like. And you can go up, you can do a keyword search for this for Wicker Man, the movie, 2006. And um, in this picture I'm looking at, it has all these different compartments. A lot of them, some of them are in the legs. Some of them are in the arms. Now, in this particular movie, they, they were actually sacrificed, and it looks like they've got a sheep there. 
and and some animals, but they've got Nicolas Cage. He's going to be in the head of this wicker man. They're not really doing it, Taylor. Okay.